time last Sunday night on the Sermon on the Mount, and I was going to spend a bit more on that. You know, it's an interesting sermon, isn't it? Jesus standing and preaching to the multitude, and you know, I often think of the audience, you know, and I, when I think about the Sermon on the Mount and the difficulty Jesus must have had in preaching to that varied group. I often wonder, as Jesus preached, as Jesus could see the heart of man, you know, he knew what everybody in that audience was thinking, didn't he? He knew if they was for him or against him, if they were trying to trick him, knew if they were just there to get what they could get from him or if they were really there to seek the truth that he had to speak. You know, we don't have that ability, thank, thankfully. Thankfully, I don't know how you could uh, hardly concentrate knowing your audience, but, you know, I think Jesus had a really varied group there, didn't he? He had a group of people who, uh, some of them were really seekers, wanted to know the truth, wanted to know Christ, God, what Jesus had to say. Some were, uh, some were just wanters, weren't they? They wanted, wanted something, wanted to be fed, wanted to be healed, wanted to be what can Jesus do for me, right? What's in it for me, you know? And some were the, the critics, right? The skeptics, the critics, the scribes, the Pharisees, the ones that were there to catch him, to trick him, to find out what they could use against him. You know, I often wondered, I've, I guess maybe we get a little bit of that sometimes in a sermon, in a congregation, but, you know, generally we don't have that type of audience to preach to, do we? We or I don't. Um, where I'm looking over my shoulder and thinking, boy, you know, what, what are they trying to catch me at, right? What are they trying to do? So, you know, I think this sermon was powerful. People say, well, you know, it's impossible. I've heard that said, you know, you just can't live it. It's just too hard. And it's just this ideal that Jesus put up. And Jesus put up a lot of real perfect ideals. And, but I really don't believe that. I think, you know, Jesus wouldn't tell us something that we can't do. And we spoke a little bit last time about the Beatitudes, about, you know, about the idea of salt and light and, and, and that. But, you know, tonight I want to talk a little bit about when he really started talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, the critics in the group. And I think that it's a, it's a powerful message that Jesus had to tell them. You and I, we, we sometimes read over that and we think, well... You know, maybe that really doesn't affect us, but if you think the audience that Jesus was speaking to and those very scribes and Pharisees he was talking about that were in that crowd, that were watching him speak, that were hanging on his words, that were listening with the intent to capture him, to trick him, it really brings power to what he was saying. And I think there's this kind of inter, there's kind of this interlude, if you want to look at it that way, between the Beatitudes and where he really gets into this, to this thought but in 17 and 5, he says, in Matthew 5, he says, Do not think I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And I think that's the part they didn't hear. Okay, I mean, because they weren't wanting to hear that, right? They weren't wanting to hear, I came to fulfill this. I came to, to, uh, to make all this right. Um, you know, you got to keep the law. They probably kind of hung on that because they thought, well, we do that, right? We do that. Matter of fact, Jesus, you know, Jesus, isn't that funny? He says, you know, you tithe the mint, the dill, the cumin, right? You know, but you neglect the way to measure the law. You should do the former without doing the latter, Jesus says. The idea that, that, you know, they, they did it in, in thought, right? They, they walked the walk. They, they, were, they were very meticulous in, in keeping the law and keeping the letter of the law, but they lost the intent of the law, and that's what Jesus is really talking about in Matthew. You have to have the intent. It's not just keeping the letter of the law. You know, it's easy for us sometimes to, even in our lives, as we talk about law, law, not, you know, God's law, but the law of the land, a lot of times we... We might keep the law, but we really don't have the intent of it. You know, does that make any sense? We, we, uh, you know, we might know that we're supposed to go a certain speed limit in a certain place, but we don't in our heart feel like that's really right because we don't do it. 
You see what I'm saying? You know, we can do it, but we don't really want to do it. We don't have the intent, right? Now, if I'm in a school zone, I'm like, I need to go 25. I need to go 20, right? Because there's kids. I have intent, you know. I don't want to speed in a school zone. I feel like that's valid, right? That's valid. But, you know, when I'm on the interstate and there's nobody around me in the middle of the night, I don't think it's quite as valid sometimes, right? You know, we lose intent, don't we? And that's kind of what Jesus was saying here. But, but the interesting thing, and I think then he really drives it home, right? He really drives it home to him in, in, in 20. He says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the, the seeds of righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That's really pointed, and it's really... And it's really powerful because those people are there. I mean, it's not like he's speaking this to somebody that's not there. Those, those guys are there. They're listening to him. They're listening to what he has to say. And he says, if you're righteousness, and these guys, they think they're the best. They think they're the cream of the crop, right? I mean, they walk the walk. They talk it. They look it. They live it. They act it. They think we're the most righteous people on earth. Look at how we dress. Look at how we act. Look at how we give. You know, I've always said if you had a congregation full of Pharisees, from the outside, you'd have a perfect congregation, wouldn't you? They'd always be here. They'd always dress right. They'd act right. They'd give right. They'd do right. But Jesus would say, oh, but you're not right. Right? You know, so it's easy for us to think on the outside, oh, that looks good. Looks right. But Jesus says, well, it ain't all about how it looks. It's about what motivates you to be who you are, to do what you do. And and Jesus says, your righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. And that had to have cut them. And that's probably the start of when they probably went, ah, right? Now what's he going to say? And then he says, listen, I'm going to tell you, it goes beyond the law. And, I, and, and, and Jesus is going to use this in this passage. He's going he's to use this, you have heard it said. And he's going to say that six times in here. He says, you've heard it said. And some of the things that he says you've heard it said, one in particular, you're not going to find that written in the Old Testament. So some of this is oral law, not just written law, but it's things that have been, that, have, that are oral, right? He said you should love your, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Well, the Bible does say to love your neighbor. The Old Testament never says to hate your enemies, but that is an oral. So sometimes it's more than just, you know, what's written. But six times he's going to say, you've heard it said. Not always you've heard it written, but you've heard it said. In other words, this is what you believe. This is what you, these are the things you hang your hat on, right? And this is, and this is what you think is important. And this is what you think is necessary to be righteous. But Jesus is going to say, it goes beyond the law. That's, that's kind of interesting in, in a way, isn't it? Ro Paul says in Romans, he said the Gentiles became a law unto themselves. And it's kind of that idea. Righteousness transcends law. There's no law against doing the right thing, Paul would say, essentially. In other words, you know, if everybody was respectful and everybody decided, oh, when I go into a school zone, there's kids and I need to drive 15 miles an hour, you don't need a law. You can throw the speed limit signs away. You don't need it right? Because you know it, and people do it. Why? Because they feel it in their heart, that's the right thing to do, and they say, that's what we're going to do, and you don't need a law to stop people from breaking it. But unfortunately, right, we don't think that way. In our minds, in our hearts, we don't always have that righteousness, have that idea. So Jesus says, listen, in order to have the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, that's what he said, he says, you got to have a righteousness that transcends the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is based on keeping that law, is based on not breaking the law. But as the Bible says, there's no life in that. He says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder right? You shall not commit adultery, certificate of divorce, false vows, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, right? You've heard it said these things, and yet Jesus says what? Jesus says it's got to go beyond this. I think we as Christians, I think we live a life that We should live a life that transcends the idea that of law you know it has to start within our heart doesn't it within inside of us um, to be right to be wrong he says on this he says what does he say 
He says, you've heard it said to those of old, verse 21, you shall not commit murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Now, he's not talking about an accidental death. We know in the Old Testament there was ways to be forgiven for that. There was, you could make a justification for that. He's not talking about when God says go and kill an enemy or go wipe out a nation. Murder here is premeditated, right? Murder, we understand that. Murder is a premeditated act. But Jesus says, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother Rockus shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Now Jesus used that very word fool at other places. So Jesus actually used that word, called people that word. So we get kind of hung up on that. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying it's the intent of our heart. To be angry, right? James says kind of the same thing. To be angry with our brother is a danger because why because murder anger these things all start within our heart don't they to be angry with our brother or mad at our brother without cause without reason that that's a danger for us you know we have to control not only our action we have to control our heart our emotion um how do we feel how do we react how do we how do we process things that happen to us in our lives? And, and I think when we really do this, it's really difficult for us, isn't it? We, we, um, we often have a hard time controlling what we are inside. You know, we feel it, don't we? I don't know, maybe y'all don't. But I mean, I have an anger sometimes within me that, you know, I just, I know what's coming, you know. Those of you that know me, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I just have that, you know, I always have had. And, uh, and it, and it, it's tough. I, I feel it. I mean, I know it's coming and, and I'm pretty really good at stopping it usually, but not always. And, uh, it's difficult for me. I read this passage and I, it really speaks to me, you know. It's easy for me to get angry. Sometimes I think I'm just angry. I'm an angry person. It's just there all the time, you know, and it just comes out sometimes. But it's easy for me to get angry. I, that's not a stretch for me at all. And, um, you know, God wants us to control that, doesn't he? He wants us to, wants us to uh, somehow tame what we are. Christianity, Christ, I've always said this, and I believe it, you know, Jesus is not about the best Rex because the best Rex is not good enough to get to heaven. I know that with all my heart. The best of me is not good enough to go to heaven. The Bible's not about the best Rex. The Bible's about making Rex look like Jesus. You know, Jesus can get to heaven. Rex ain't going to get there. I mean, I'm just telling you. And when I read these passages, I have to relate it to Christ. You know, was Christ never not an angry person? No. He got angry, didn't he? Got angry in the temple, threw the money changers out. You see, so when we look at these passages in this, we're thinking, well, you know, we can never be angry. Well, that's not really what Jesus taught us. That's not really what he's saying. But I think there's a righteous anger. I think there's a constructive anger. And I think there's a destructive anger. You know, and I think we have a decision how we're going to be. So when you look at passages, I think in the Sermon on the Mount especially, compare it to Jesus. The very word, we get a hung up on that word fool, but Jesus used that very word in speaking of, to people. So the word itself wasn't the issue, right? There's a righteous judgment. There's a righteousness sometimes in anger. There's a righteousness sometimes in what we say. But a lot of times there's not. So it's not, it's the intent of the heart, you see, and, and we have to pull it back to that. If we take this passage and we make it a law, in other words, if we say, okay, I can never be angry, I can never call anybody a fool, then we're doing exactly what the scribes and Pharisees were doing. We're trying to, to put it to law. And Jesus says, don't, you can't do that. You have to put it to your heart. You know, Jesus didn't say, oh, I'm never going to be angry because Jesus was angry. But what Jesus said was, he said, when I'm angry, it's a righteous anger. It's, not a, it's, it's a righteous anger. It's an anger that I need to have. It's an anger that's constructive. It's an anger that accomplishes God's, God's will, God's purpose. But I can also be angry, as it says at the beginning of this, angry without cause, can I? Angry without reason. Angry for no reason. 
angry because you took my parking spot or because you took the last piece of cake at potluck you know don't do that right you know and so we get beyond this beyond this idea and then he says after that he said uh he says um you know therefore if you bring your gift to the altar remember that your brother has something against you leave your gift there and go your way and be reconciled and then come and offer your gift what is he really saying here you know if you really look at this passage in 23 he says what he says and i really think we miss this sometimes he says listen to what he says he says remember that your brother has something against you you know that's that's different than me having something against my brother because that's proactive isn't it that's me saying oh well bobby's upset with me i need to go find out why bobby's upset with me you know now we know as christians right bobby should come to me and tell me why he's upset with me right but he has he's failed to do that he failed to do that right and if i know that you're upset with me then i need to seek you out i don't need to say well you know i'll wait till bobby comes to me right oh wait you know i'm gonna i'm gonna make him be the bigger man right when he comes to me well i'm ready to forgive him when he comes to me but that's not what jesus says jesus says if my brother has something against me i need to find out what it is i have a responsibility to make it right with my brother before god's going to accept my gift that's tough isn't it jesus turns it around and puts it on us not on our brother we know how it's supposed to work if i offend you you're supposed to come to me and say oh guess what rex you offended me and we need to talk that's how it should work but it doesn't always work that way and so jesus turns it around on us and he says you've got to be the bigger person you have to be proactive in your righteousness it's not just enough to sit back and say oh well i'm a righteous guy you know if he was man enough to come talk to me i'd be man enough to forgive him right it's not about that it's about being proactive and i think when you look at all these things where jesus says beyond law you begin to get the idea of exactly what what jesus is talking about here he says he says to them he says agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison Assuredly, I say to you, by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. I'm not going to get very far tonight. But I'm going to tell you, this speaks volumes to me. It always has. You know, what is the soul of your brother worth or your sister worth to you? What's it worth? How much? You know, I wish you, somebody would give me a price on that. I wish somebody would tell me what the soul of another person is worth to you because when we when we as christians put things in the way of our brother or sister to keep them from going to heaven who do you think is responsible for that you know is it worth being mad over that is it worth it in the end did they steal ten thousand dollars from you is your soul worth ten is their soul worth ten thousand dollars did they slight you did they say something against you did they offend you big deal you know i think the hardest thing sometimes for christians is to do business with each other you know do you agree with that you know i've talked to buck about this a lot you know it's easier for me to do business with somebody to do jobs for people that aren't christians because every time i do a job or work or do something for a christian i'm always afraid i'm always scared i'm gonna offend them i'm gonna why why are we that way you know it should be we should want to do business we should want to have relationships with brothers and sisters in christ we should we should have that relationship that we can get through anything right we can get through anything but we don't we struggle because we forget 
that a soul is worth more than anything that I possess. And if we remember that, it becomes a lot easier. And I think, I think it's something we had to consider. Life is not always about what you do. And listen to me right here. Sometimes life is about how people take what you do. You know? How they perceive you. How they judge your actions, your intent. your Because all the time we're looking at each other, aren't we? We're judging each other, sizing each other up. We're making the call about one another. And as Christians, we should, you know, we've got to love each other. That's the best way I know to put it. You know, love takes care of this. Love fixes it. You know, we're family. We're not, this isn't a business deal. It's not a competition. It's not a, it's a family. And families have to be able to work through their problems, work through their trials, their difficulties, pick their fights, right? Pick the mountain they want to die on. And in the end, we all want to go to heaven, don't we? And in the end, we should care about each other going to heaven. We should care about our souls, care about the souls of our brothers and sisters, care about those people around us. And you know, wouldn't you rather be wrong? I love how Paul says that, you know. Wouldn't you rather be wrong than be right and cost somebody their soul? I would. I would. I'd a lot rather be wrong. I don't know how you say that be the bigger man, be the whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm more worried about you going to heaven than I am about material things in my life. And I think you should be more worried about me going to heaven than about material things in your life. I just do. And I think if we do that, then we do what Jesus is saying right here on the Sermon on the Mount. We are proactive in our faith, right? We seek out people who maybe observed something we did or took something we did in the wrong way, maybe wasn't our intent, maybe wasn't our, uh, that we should offend or that we should cause somebody to stumble, but maybe we do. And we should be proactive in that. What did I do? What can I do? Because, you know, we all got to get to heaven. And we're not going to do that being mad at each other. It's not going to happen. The only way we're going to do that is loving each other. And if that means we get took advantage of every once in a while, if that means we've got to put other people ahead of ourselves, isn't that what the Bible says we're supposed to do anyway? Put other people ahead of ourselves? Then that's all right. You know, this is not undoable. It's just hard, right? It's not undoable. It's just hard. And we have to look like Christ, not like us. And when we strive to do that, we are going to make the right decisions. When we put us in the way, then we're not going to make those decisions right. Because you and I, we uh, have a little bit of us in us, don't we? And sometimes us isn't always the best thing. So, didn't get far. But uh, thanks for your time this evening. If we can help you in any way, won't you let it be known while we stand?